Well, hello. Hey there. Hi there. Ho there. You're as welcome as can be. Uh, so nice to see you. It's three o'clock on Saturday, December 5th. It's a brisk, breezy day in New York City here in the West Village. Old Glory is flying magnificently on top of that oligarch's mansion to be on the corner of, uh, well, Lulu. Lulu can't wait to meet that guy, and neither can I. Anyway, what, what can I say? It's a privilege and an honor to be here to play for you today. And let's get right down to it. Come on, Lulu, cooperate. Now. That is uh, Walking and Talking It. Uh, it's an instrumental. I remember writing this in Prague uh, after I got after a, the wreckage of a gig. It's, it's really, it's a shocking story. I guess I could tell it here. I, I have written it up. If you go to GaryLucas.com, it's in the writing se sections, and it's the prologue to my next book of memoirs, Vampire Circus. At least that's what I'm calling it nowadays. And uh, it's everything that was left out of the Jeff Buckley book, uh, Touched by Grace. But, but basically what happened was I found myself uh, playing uh, some gigs in the summer of 2002. I had a residency uh, at the Sunset Jazz Club in Paris. And uh, I had three nights there, two shows a night. It was kind of three shows a night, actually. It was, it was strenuous. As, like, the last show didn't start till about midnight, which is typical for a jazz club. And I had to get up after the third night to catch a train to Gare du Nord, which is one of the main train stations in Paris. And I had a very long travel day to... The Czech Republic, which is uh, my ancestral home on my father's side. Uh, and uh, there was a change in Frankfurt, I remember. So anyway, I, I had all these guitars. I was weighed down with, I was taking three guitars on the road with me in those days. And uh, they weighed a ton and they were in calzone cases. I had custom made at Manny's music, which no longer exists on 48th Street, but was quite the uh, 
It was quite the hot spot for um, musicians to hobnob with, all those H's. Anyway, uh, I got there, and it was a real shrek, as they say in Yiddish. It was a real horror to get on that train with all this stuff, but I had some assistance. And so I was hunkered down nicely until we got to Frankfurt, at which point I had about a five-minute change of train. And I had arranged through Deutsche Bahnhof, the German railway, to be met at my car with a porter to help transport all of my gear uh, to the, the next train I had to board with five minutes only. And uh, when I got off the train, somehow I managed to get all this gear off the train. I was standing on the platform and nobody showed up. It was a disgrace, but it happens. So I don't know, I had to beg for a euro. I don't think I had any change in my pocket and I needed to get a luggage cart Somehow I managed to catch a euro and I got the stuff on the luggage cart. And then I had to find this other track and it was all the way across the station. So my heart was beating wildly in my chest. If you know your car 54, where are you? You'll know that line. Uh, but I finally got to the train and uh, managed to throw everything on and board just as the doors were closing. And then I was okay. Uh, I had another change of train in Dresden, which was also a horror, but at least I got met there. And there I had to schlep up a flight of stairs with assistance to another track. They didn't have lifts. Yeah, uh, the things I used to put myself through back in the day in order to do this. But, you know, looking back on it, I kind of love it at the same time. But man, I don't know how I did it. Anyway, so uh, I got on that train. And this was a really nice train, an old-fashioned train that went direct from Dresden all the way to Prague. And in so far as there was a dining car with actual lovely tablecloths with lace on the tables and you could get a nice glass tea, as they say in the, in the, in, in the Jewish parlance, a nice glass tea. And I got to Prague and I was met there by my friend and enabler, Richard Matter, AKA Faust. And Richard was gonna take me that night, I oh yeah, I had a gig in Slovakia, if you can believe it. I'd never played there before. It used to be Czechoslovakia. Well, they had split the year before into two separate republics. And so uh, I was playing in the capital city. And so it, it was a nice club and it was a nice gig. And I slept at a friend's house, though, you know, there wasn't a lot of money for this gig. But after all, it was my first and actually, to this day, my only gig in Slovakia, and it was nice. The very next day, we were going to drive back to Prague because I had a gig in a town called Kolin on the other side of Prague in the Czech Republic, my only gig there. And uh, we had lunch at a restaurant right on the beautiful Blue Danube, which flows all the way down through Germany into the Czech Republic. And uh, after lunch, we got in his car and on the way back out of the parking lot and onto a road to take us to the highway, I saw a sign that flashed by very quickly. And the sign read C-A-C. And uh, I read it as the word CAC. You know, I don't know if you're familiar with this word, but it was used a lot during the Vietnam War era to describe uh, sudden death. You know, what happened to the sergeant last night? Oh man, he, he was cacked. You know, he was like he was fragged. He could have been shot by somebody. In any case, it had death connotations all over it. And that's how I read it. And suddenly I got this notion. I never in my life ever had such a idée fixe, as they say in French, or obsessive uh, thought. But I did at that moment. And the thought was, I'm gonna see death today. Okay. which is not my preoccupation as much as I love horror films and ghostly supernatural things. I'm not a death freak by any means. I love life. But I made a joke years ago, like when I was working for ABC News Freelance to do soundtracks for their 2020 documentary show, whenever there was some death in the air, in other words, a show about the Unabomber or a guy's last day on death row, in a penitentiary or something, <laughs> somebody, some producer up there would say, I wonder what Gary is doing. And I would get the gig. So uh, anyway, this is my ghostly or ghastly, as Richard called it, my ghastly guitar style. So, 
So anyway, I got this notion, I'm going to see death today, and I said to Faust, slow down, buddy. You know, no speeding and no beer at lunch. He was a tippler. I'm a teetotaler and still am. And, uh, okay, and then I forgot about it. We had lunch someplace again, and uh, or a snack. Then we got to uh, Prague. We drove all the way through it, out the other end, and on to Colin. And I got to this club, and uh, it was La France, the La France Club. I have pictures posted with the story if you want to check it out. And uh, it was basically kind of a dump, you know, but, and at first I was depressed about that, but then I was like, man, this is uh, like in the tradition, you know, of a roadhouse from Southern United States, or this is the kind of stuff that the blues masters who I love cut their teeth in, you know, on a chitlin circuit or whatever. I mean, it, it might not be an elegant place to play, but it sure is funky. They had one music room, adjacent to the bar. The, most of the action was in the bar, and people were drinking their heads off, as they do, especially in the Czech Republic. So I felt good about that. Like, okay, you know, this will, just, this will be fun. Then I looked at the roster of people who played there, like my friend Elliot Murphy had just been there. I said, oh, well, they have a pretty good booking policy here, and uh, as it was my only gig in the Czech Republic, I was looking forward to it. And as the twilight came on, lo and behold, all of these like cars with their headlights shining pulled into the parking lot in this d deserted place in the country. No street lights really illuminating the area. And uh, I got a full house, man. I had like a couple hundred people packed into this room with green astroturf on the floor and uh, some kind of like bad psychedelic mural on the wall behind me. And I played my heart out. And uh, while I was there, I saw two of my friends, uh, David Nemitz and Andre Nemitz, and they're old friends of mine. Their mother was in jail with Václav Havel, who later became my friend, who was the president of the Czech Republic. Uh, she was a famous dissident and a signer of the Charter 77, if you know about the... Uh, the, uh, the end of uh, communist rule in the Czech Republic, that was a key document to help propel this, this idea of a democratically elected president along. Anyway, uh, and they were drinking, and uh, so was everybody but me in the club. Maybe they had some Coca-Cola or something, but I mean, I'm not bragging about that. I'm not exactly, I have no moral objection to people who are into alcohol. I just find I can operate better with a clear head and handle stress better. I mean, and this is somebody who <laughs> lived in a cloud of marijuana for about 20, 30 years. But again, different strokes for different folks. So I just know me. And uh, at the, I saw a guy like bobbing his head with long stringy hair and dancing and I clocked him at the gig while I was playing because he had an unusual look. And at the end, I don't know, that got a lot of cheering and shouts for encores. And I came out and I said, as my father once told me, leave him wanting more. Good night, everybody. I think I did one encore, but I could have done more. And that was it. So uh, I felt real good about this gig. And everybody was happy. And those brothers came up to me and said, that was beautiful. We got to go. We'll see you in Prague tomorrow or the next day. I had a couple days off. So they left. And uh, I packed up my gear with the help of Faust. I was carrying all this like pedals and whatnot. I used to go out with an enormous amount of electronics to do these shows. And uh, got out and it was dark. <laughs> I mean, it was like one or two, 2 a.m. No street lamps. We got in his car, we took off. And we were about five minutes down the road, this winding road, and suddenly came upon a car with flashing lights and we drove slowly through the scene and I looked out and there was something going on, but I got a very horrible vibe. So I said, slow down, I think that's an accident. You know, we should check it out. So he stopped the car in the middle of the highway and then backed up slowly. I rolled down the window in the passenger seat and there was the two brothers, one of them standing on a cell phone calling in this accident and the other one kneeling over a corpse, basically, or the remnants of a corpse, because this guy's foot was in the road and his shoe. It was pretty horrible. And uh, he had impacted 
They hadn't seen him. He was walking home from the gig in the middle of the highway, and they'd slammed into him. He'd gone through the windshield, and my friend had been cut by glass, but they were okay. But he was he was dying, and so they said, you should leave, you should leave. You had nothing to do with this. Police are coming, please. So we took off, and suddenly the horror of the whole situation dawned on me, and I turned to my friend and I said, I told you we were going to see death today, didn't I tell you? And Richard got all hard-boiled on me, and he just went, that's life, that's life. And I reminded him we'd done a record called The Ghost of Prague a couple of years previous to that, and had a track about a guy who was cut to pieces. It was Czech ghost stories, basically. And that was the chorus, cut to pieces, cut to pieces. So, it was just a horrible homecoming, and when we finally got back to Prague, um, I was just, you know, shattered by this experience. And uh, the next day, I went into his studio, he had a basement studio, it still does. It's called uh, Faust Studios, if you are in Prague. It's a state-of-the-art custom studio, I recommend it. Albeit, it might be a bit haunted down there in the basement, but uh, we were going to work on a new album uh, using a guy's very eerie paintings. It was going to be an interactive CD-ROM, like pictures in an exhibition, you know, with some musical cues, and then you flash to the next picture on your computer. This is really before the advent of, of uh, let's say, DVD art in a big way. And uh, I couldn't focus. I could not focus, because I was just haunted by this episode. And uh, I just spent the next few days in a remote control, basically. I remember taking the train to Amsterdam to play at the Holland Festival, a show at the Paradiso. It was my best show there. It was packed. I don't even remember. I just went through the motions, and I was detached, kind of watching myself play while I was doing it. And then I got back to New York, and I said, I got to call up my friend David and find out what happened. So I called the guy. And he said, okay, well, we're okay, Gary. I'm glad you called us. The other guy, he was a German tourist. He shouldn't have been walking where he was, but it was an accident. We didn't see him. He was at the gig, and I was like, right, that was the guy I saw with the stringy hair. And uh, anyway, but do you know, Gary, what night of the year that was? And I said, no. And he said, April 30th, Walpurgis Nacht. That is, in Central Europe, which is Sabbath. It's kind of a, it's a pagan f holiday. It's kind of like a spring version of Halloween. And all of the evil spirits are supposed to roam the land on that night. And many places in Germany, for instance, I've seen this, they build bonfires and have kind of worst roasting over the bonfire and bang pots and pans to drive out evil spirits. And uh, there's actually a scene in Goethe's Faust of... Uh, Faust, Dr. Faustus, being taken to the Hearts Mountain, uh, which is the Brooken, where the witches congregate and seeing naked witches on broomsticks. They actually have a tourist attraction around uh, Walpurgisnacht now in that region where the mountain is, so you can go up there and see naked witches for hire. But anyway, just to make a long story short, that horrified me, because it was like, hey, you know, I was given a message. I called my friend Francis, McCarthy is like a good old friend of mine who's quite up on these things and had had similar paranormal experiences. And I told him that story, and he said, well, you've been given a vision. Now you've got to decide what to do about it. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you love to play all these bluesy music, you know, Rolling Stones music, this kind of godless music, and uh, you should just be maybe concentrating on Chinese pop from the 30s. Well, yeah, it was a good attempt. And uh, I said, are you, are you saying to me that these death metal bands are all going to hell, if you believe in hell, because of their singing about Lucifer and whatnot? And he said, well, I don't know, but you know, you just have to make that choice. Then I rang another friend of mine, I told him what happened, and he, I said, I'm thinking of quitting music, because I felt like a guy who stirred up this crowd with my ghostly guitar, further intoxicating an already rowdy bunch of people. And then suddenly, you know, it was like a ripple, a stone in the pond ripple effect. And this was the denouement. This was the end result was this death at the end of the line of the vibrations I'd set off. And my friend said, it was an accident. Bullshit. Keep going. Go the distance. So, you know, it's too late to stop now. 
And here I am. Oh, I hope you find that story as entertaining as I am. But I tell you, what are the odds that you would have such a notion? Because I never, I'm not prone to this. I never had one ever before or subsequently. And that, uh, you know, you might see death at the end of the, the evening, right? And the notion was, I'm going to see death today. Not, they're not like, you know, good odds, man. I wonder what, what the mathematical possibility is there. But uh, when I tell this to rational scientific types, they just poo-poo it and say, well, that was coincidence. But uh, like I ask you, what are the odds you're going to actually see that outcome? But anyway, some, some cheerful thoughts. After Strange Gods, that is the first single released from my forthcoming album, The Essential Gary Lucas. Uh, I posted a clip not too long ago, and I will post it again when we're done here. And then there's a pre-ordered link to the record, which is out January 29th. It's a double CD uh, of what I consider Essential Gary Lucas tracks. I don't know. I'm like the, the mother, father... <laughs> of a whole brood of children, i.e. my songs. And it's difficult for me to pick my favorites, you know? I mean, I have some that I think are stronger than others, maybe, but it just depends on your mood. So uh, watch for that or order that even better. And now here, I'm gonna do a little riff on, on some uh, books. I'm actually very partial, I was talking about this last time, to female writers. And, but what, what female writers particularly get, get me going are those that deal, let us say, honestly but provocatively with the erotic side of things. Now, this is a subject that seems to have been the exclusive purview of male writers forever and ever. And yet, some of the most potent erotic literature in the past and in the present is written by women. And I can think of 
many examples uh, going back to, I guess, Aeneas Nin, who was a contemporary of Henry Miller's and uh, many of the artists in Paris there in the 20s, you know, wrote some very elegant pornographic short stories that were collected uh, in a couple of anthologies. Little Birds was the name of one, and uh, I don't know. So this this kind of like set me off on a, on a hunt. There's another writer who was a friend of mine here in New York who passed away a few years, who was great, named Iris Owens, who wrote a very non, a famous non-pornographic book called After Claude, which has a preface and an introduction by my old friend Emily Prager. So check that out. But she also wrote books for the Olympia Press under her pseudonym Harriet Daimler, as in the car, as in the sports car Daimler, that she really pushed it, the boundaries. And the, her publisher, Maurice Girodias, who founded the Olympia Press, who, among other things, published Lolita and uh, J.P. John Levy, er, early work, was also a bit of a pirate, fascinating character. He said that she wrote more transgressively than his male authors and was constantly pushing the boundaries of censorship or like possible censorship of her books. And a couple of years ago, me and Mike Edison did a, an event at the New York Public Library on 42nd Street on, uh, I guess, anti-censorship day and... Uh, he read from his then book, Miss America, I think is the title, very good book. Check it out. And I, I read from some of Iris Owen's writings, particularly some Harriet Daimler uh, books. There's a novel called Darling, which is a really good one, and another one called Innocence. Uh, and The Woman Thing, they're all really good. The Pleasure Thieves, these are some titles that are worth checking out. But okay, so in that same vein, I want to recommend this book. I don't know if it's still in print. It's called Ooh La La and Contemporary French Erotica by Women. Okay, so I don't know how this will sit with the Me Too crowd, but uh, I'm all for the free expression of, uh, of imagination by men and women. Okay, so one of the best stories in here is actually by a friend of mine. I want to give a shout out to and this is Sophie Marielle, who published a couple of books under the name, the pseudonym Mari L, the letter L, period. And she has one in here, Mako, which is really good. Sonia Riquiel, I've worked with her son. She's got a play in here, a one-act play. Jean de Berg, who wrote The Image, which is another erotic classic. It's quite a good book if you can find it. Ooh la la. Also in the same vein, here's Virginie de Pont who wrote a book called Besmoi, basically Fuck Me, which was made into a movie, and has since gone on to write some really fantastic feminist, notoriously feminist, pushing the envelope books that are kind of cross between punk books and erotic books. And uh, this is Bye Bye Blondie, published by the Feminist Press at the City University of New York. And uh, they're really, really good. There's about three or four of them out that I'm wading through. And uh, there's a film of Besmois that was pretty good, too, that she was involved in. Lastly, here's a biography by Martin Duberman of Andrea Dworkin, who famously was an anti-pornography crusader, a former call girl, actually, and hooker, who was put through the mill and then revised her thinking about the, uh, the worth of the experience, no doubt, and uh, also wrote some provocative books, maybe inadvertently provocative books. She has one called On Pornography, in which she, she basically encapsulates three or four pornographic books under discussion in her book, and this, her descriptions alone are pornographic, I mean, and, you know, famously turned on guys reading them, so I can't wait to delve into this book. And uh, the list goes on, also in the visual arts. My sister Bonnie has often pushed the envelope with her art. She got a big write-up in the New York Times a couple of months ago. Check out her work, Bonnie Lucas. She did the cover of my album, Operators Are Standing By, which was a compilation that came out, oh, I don't know, about 20 years ago. But it, it, <laughs> the name of the, the images of her painting, which I use for the cover, is 
girl with big mm -hmm. shoes. Check that out. And uh, okay, now that I've offended everybody out there by my non-PC uh, stance, I don't know. I, uh, I'm certainly not about censorship. And, uh... Well, it's almost time to go. I'll play one more little one here. Before I forget, also check out my friend Tracy Kwan's books. Tracy was an actual dominatrix sex worker, and she's written a couple of of classics of the genre. One is called Diary of a Jet Setting Call Girl, really good. And uh, also the work of my friend Cheyenne Chavon in Paris. She's a visual artist and a DJ, but she does some pretty amazing graphics. And uh, you can check her out on Instagram and see some of her work because it's, it's awfully good and compelling. And that's about it for today, okay? I'm uh, happy to have gotten through another week here with you. I look forward to our next encounter on Tuesday, 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And until then, please stay safe, wear that mask, and uh, let's try, us, us Americans here in the U.S., to try and lick this thing and get the rate down. It's like rising alarmingly and uh you know we have to be vigilant and disciplined and uh yeah no one wants to hear anything as Lou Reed said you can't tell anybody anything but you know I'm, I'm just stating a fact that should be evident all right love you guys and I'll see you on Tuesday at three bye now <laughs>